Dobry Jack. <laughs> Minyaza Wut Wolfgang Nieder. Ja Nemnoga Gavariu Baroski. Ja Ocean Rad Priyat Yechat Baroski. Is Paul Nilas Maya Mishta Priyachat Vermasku Smaim Kolegioi i Drugom Professorum Kevinam McKenna. On Bill Maim Uchitelia Uchitelia Roscovo Yazika the University Stata Vermont. Ja minja Balshoya Chess Par Luchit Pri Glashenje Ot Andrea Kibrika Maria Koshovoy I Pabla Nova Kochit Chat Lectio of Amerikanska Posmovica. Ja na moga na šilcija u vosiskih parinologov na primjer Grigori Vlovec Vermjakov. Ja takše rad vidjet zjes maih koleg i truzje. Ja na dejus što vam pan Ravicija Maja Lekcija. Bal show je spasivno. I practice this at least 25 times. Dimitri, I see you. How do you like my Russian? I'm absolutely surprised. Oh, well, I practiced it at least 25 times, but it didn't go well, so I, I, I'm sorry. Anyhow, thank you for inviting my dear friend Kevin McKenna and me to, to Moscow. Uh, as I just said, for, for me it is an absolute dream come true. Uh, Kevin has been in Moscow over 40 times, but for me it is the first time. And, and, uh, it really has been a dream for me living in America and, and coming to Russia, a country that I've always admired, like the literature, the language, the culture. And uh, so being here is a, a really a very special event. And thank you all for coming. And I will try to explain to you a little bit what American proverbs uh, might be about, what, what the problems are when, you, when we look at American proverbs. And, what perhaps we can learn from them, and uh, also deal, of course, a little bit with <coughs> what modern paranoiology uh, is basically dealing with. Anyhow, I gave my talk the title of Life is a Journey, a Modern American Proverb, and I thought that would be an appropriate title since uh, Kevin and I came on a long trip uh, to be with you today. And at the upside, uh, subtitle is Aspects of Homegrown American Proverbs. Uh, it might appear as if proverbs are of little relevance in the modern society of the United States. In fact, there are scholars who have claimed that proverbs have no place in this technologically advanced society, and the mass media repeatedly declare in popular magazines and newspaper articles that traditional proverbs with uh, their didactic and often moralistic messages are no longer of any value. Nothing, I would say, could be further from the truth, as can be seen from the literally thousands of studies on proverbs that continue to thrive throughout the world. New proverb collections are also appearing for major and minor languages with comparative international compendia showing that people everywhere distill their observations and experiences into ready-made bits of wisdom. Am I going slowly enough? The students, students, yeah, you can follow? Yeah, everything okay? The time of proverb making and the effective use of them in all modes of oral and written communication is not over. And the traditional as well as innovative employment of proverbs 
quite often in the form of anti-proverbs, is alive and well in the modern American society. The fascinating field of proverbs is still plenty untilled, not really worked completely, giving scholars and students the challenging opportunity to study old and new proverbs in a multitude of contexts as formulaic expressions or sound bites, if you want to use the more modern terms, indicating to a certain degree people's attitudes, beliefs, mores, and values that contain aspects of a complex American worldview. The interplay of tradition and innovation that is characteristic of folklore in general is also evident in the all-encompassing world of proverbs. The modern American proverb, think outside the box, to the earliest date from 1971, should be the guiding principle for paramiographers and paramiologists as well as cultural historians, folklorists, linguists, philologists, and scholars from other disciplines. One of the basic problems, despite the numerous collections and studies on various aspects of American proverbs, is the vexing question of what really makes an American proverb. Many of the most popular proverbs found in the United States are much older than, let's say, colonial times. Such proverbs as big fish eat little fish, fish and one swallow does not make a summer, go back to antiquity, just like they do in your language, of course. The proverbs pride goes before fall and man does not live by bread alone come from the Bible. You have those in Russian as well. And such favorite proverbs as strike while the iron is hot or all that glitters is not gold originated in the Latin of the Middle Ages, and again, they were translated into Russian and most of the other European languages. They were alone translated into the European languages and belonged to an international stock of proverbial wisdom. The early English-speaking settlers brought them, in our case, to North America, together with favorite English proverbs like the early bird catches the worm, and a stitch in time saves nine. But they are most certainly not of American origin. Collections of proverbial language should indeed be more careful in using the term American. British American would probably be a better term, but even that will not reflect the actual situation. Since such terms are not really avoidable, however, for practical reasons, the introductions should explain that these lingual cultural terms actually mean proverbs known, used, and common in the United States, let's say. In 1992, I did a, a rather large dictionary of American proverbs and always felt that that really was not a very good title. But I couldn't very well call the book the dictionary of perhaps, maybe, should be American <laughs> proverbs, but they also happen to be used in New Zealand and in India and in Australia and in Russia. You know. So uh, anyhow, but I think it is important uh, in the introduction of such compendia to point out what does that really mean, dictionary of American proverbs. This does not, of course, mean that there are no really, truly American proverbs. To start with, there are Native American proverbs. Uh, we use Native American, you know, I mean Indian by that. But despite scholarly attempts by anthropologists, folklorists, and linguists, only very few proverbs have been registered. In fact, it remains a conundrum or a riddle why there is such a dearth or lack of proverbs in the Native American languages. Some, many of you are linguists. It is a really a, a, an unanswered question why we have so few Native American proverbs. Uh, I give you at least a couple that true Native American proverbs, we only have about 250, 300 of them. It doesn't make any sense if you think about the tribal languages of Africa, which has thousands of them. Anyhow, here are at least a couple a deer, although toothless, 
may accomplish something which has kind of the meaning of one should not judge another person by outward appearances. Or, as a second one, if one talks loudly, the cave will answer, which in its basic meaning would be anybody who acts uh, antisocially does not deserve to live in a house, but rather ought to live in a cave. In other words, socially unacceptable. Regrettably, as far as is known, the few proverbs that have been found have not entered the English language. That, in addition to it all, it appears that Native Americans communicate their generational wisdom by way of metaphors and narratives, but not necessarily by proverbs. It still, to this day, doesn't make any sense to me. And we can talk about this later. Why is that? You know? Uh, famous, famous anthropologists like Franz, Francis Boas have attempted to find proverbs among the Native Americans. I made a prize competition in the States, putting up a little bit of my own money to get anthropologists, linguistic anthropologists, to try again. Nobody responded. That's another problem. <laughs> Anyhow, considering the complex makeup of the United States, as a country of immigrants and refugees of many cu lingual cultural backgrounds, it is important to observe that all of these different folk groups brought, of course, their proverbial wisdom with them in their native languages, of which some have become current in the form of English loan translations. African slaves carried proverbs with them and created their very own proverbs a phenomenon that can be observed in the richly documented proverbial tradition among African Americans. Such significant modern proverbs as different strokes for different folks, I, the earliest reference I found is from 1945, and what goes around comes around from 1961, have quickly entered the mainstream of American culture from their African American origin. Expectedly, Spanish language proverbs are current in the United States with those of Mexican Americans having been studied more extensively than others. Proverbs have also been collected, as you would expect, from the Chinese, the Germans, the Irish, the Italian, the Jews, Polish, Russian, of course, and other immigrant groups. And there's even a study on the proverbs of the Hmong refugees who fled Laos after the Vietnam War uh, came to an end and settled primarily in California and Minnesota. New tides of immigrants, notably from the Middle East, are arriving in this country, providing excellent opportunities for anthropologists, folklorists, linguists, to undertake modern field research about their proverbs. I would stress that to the students. You know, it would be fun for you to come to America and say, I'm going to look at what are the Russian proverbs like among the Russian population in New York City. Are they, are they changing? Have they picked up American words? Are there new ones? Are there new Russian proverbs in the immigrant group that aren't even known in Russia? That would be kind of fun. It ought to be possible. Some of them, of course, will be loan translations from the English. But why should an immigrant group not also, because of a new cultural background, invent new problems? So, so that would be, you know, if you like to do field research, there's a lot you, can, you, you, you could uh, do. Anyhow, uh, but this is, I would argue, only one side of the coin of proverbs uh, from the immigrants. The other side is the question whether any of their foreign language proverbs become established in the American culture as loan translations. For example, it has been shown that the German proverbs, man muss das Kind nicht mit dem Bade ausschütten, und, and der Apfel fällt nicht weit vom Stamm, have become the common English language proverbs, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, and of course the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But this is a two-way street, as you can imagine, if one considers that the English language is the lingua franca of the world that plays an international role that centuries ago was handled by classical and medieval Latin. 
the, the big reason why we have so many common European uh, proverbs. But I would argue nowadays the English language is, has taken on that particular role. It should not come as a surprise that British and American proverbs in particular are spread of, to other languages and cultures of the world. A fine example is the British proverb, the early bird catches the worm. Earliest reference is from 1636, that for centuries has been considered the absolute equivalent of the German proverb, Morgenstunde hat Gold im Munde. Many of you know it, which earliest date I have established is from 1570. Now, the morning hour has a golden mouth, but both these national proverbs have existed next to each other for a long time, several centuries. But since about 1980, the German translation of the early bird catches the worm, in beautiful German translation, der Trüger Vogel fängt den Wurm, has gained steady currency in the German-speaking countries, and frequency studies have shown that especially young German speakers prefer the loan translation over the German proverb by now. This is absolutely phenomenal. I had a German student from the University of Augsburg in this last semester, about 21, 22, and I said to her, Christina, what do you say back home at the University of Augsburg when you know your mother comes in your room and wants to get you out of bed? She said, der früher Vogel fängt den Wort. He says, you've got to be kidding me. She says, how about Morgenstunde that gold money? Oh, no, I wouldn't use that. <laughs> <laughs> and when was it? Maybe 19... I know, Kevin, you're thinking about my age. It, it was in 1980. <laughs> <laughs> when I was middle-aged in the 1980s, I wrote a book on Morgenstunde that gold money and showed by statistical means that it was almost the highest in popularity of German problems. And in a matter of 20, 30 years, it is almost not gone, but the young people certainly prefer the English, the English loan, loan translation. So, so you can see there are some very uh, quick changes taking place that maybe we older paramyologists would not have expected. But you're never too old to learn, right? You, or maybe to use an English proverb, you can teach an old dog once in a while a new trick. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try to prove that to you now. Uh, American proverbs are clearly conquering the world market as well. With the proverb, good fences make good neighbors, uh, popularized by a wonderful poem by the Vermont poet Robert Frost, its famous poem, Mending Wall, from 1914, having been loan, tr loan translated into German and other languages during the second half of the 20th century. Many contextualized references in literary works and the mass media deal with fences as positive and aesthetic structures, housing feuds over fences, metaphorical fences, the law and fences, international politics and fences, and the need for fences in a modern socio-political world. All of this shows that the American proverb, good fences make good neighbors, is by no means a simple piece of folk wisdom. The proverb certainly takes on a very ambiguous role as it is applied to the political ramifications of building walls, as for example, at the borders between Mexico and the United States, or between Israel and the Palestinians. As such, this American proverbial insight has become one of the global metaphors for the divisive socio-political world we live in today. The medical folk proverb, an apple keeps the doctor away, started in around 1870, and some more modern American proverbs have also been adopted in other countries in their original English language or in translation, as for example, and you know some of these in Russian as well by now, one picture is worth a thousand words, you say in Russian, don't you? Okay. Started in America in 1911, the glass is either half full or half empty, 1930. Think globally, act locally, 1942. It takes two to tangle, famous song with Pearl Bailey from 1952. The fact that such proverbs are globally distributed and accepted as general truth shows 
that the observations and experiences found in the American culture are transposable to other peoples of the world. Or stated slightly differently, these proverbs reveal that the formerly heterogeneous worldviews of different nationalities or ethnicities are becoming perhaps more homogeneous in a globalized environment. While the number of American proverbs gaining an international currency is slowly but steadily increasing, there is, of course, a richness of indigenous American proverbs that were coined in the English language over the last few centuries. It is just that little attention has been paid to differentiate among English language proverbs, with collections simply, as I said, referring to English, American, or at least Anglo-American proverbs, which still excludes proverbs in English from Australia, Canada, New Zealand, India, and other countries where English is spoken. In any case, collections of American proverbs have not made any <coughs> distinctions as far as actual origin is concerned. But there is now at least a first attempt of identifying true American proverbs based on historical <coughs> research, to wit, I have to mention one of my books here, it's called Different Strokes for Different Folks, and the German, I wrote it for my, for my German friends, the 1250, uh, oh, in English, authentic American proverbs. So what I've attempted in that book is I have 1,250 proverbs where I have tried to establish, let's hope beyond somewhat doubt, that they really did originate it uh, uh, in the United States. And to the young students in particular, as you can imagine, the internet helps me an awful lot. I mean, the Google searches are not perfect, but they certainly help me to establish that what I think is a modern proverb actually has some currency uh, and so on, and also help me with the dates. I'd like to give you a few of those proverbs in a historical sense, I'll just a few. Uh, time and chance happen to all men is one of the early ones, 1677. Notice this one, money is power, you know, kind of a proverb you think of our capitalistic society. Already in 1741, uh, facts don't lie, a proverb that we talk a lot about with Mr. Trump. Uh, facts don't lie, 1748. Uh, lost time is never found again. Three removes is, is as bad as a, a fire. One of, one of the few proverbs that Benjamin Franklin actually coined, even though most Americans think he coined hundreds. He copied all of them. Here's a true American one. You can tell by the realia. Paddle your own canoe. 1802. Right? Competition is the life of trade. Here's a surprise. It pays to advertise. Now, I would have thought that would be relatively new, wouldn't you? Yeah. Pays to advertise? 1868. Mm -hmm. That surprised me. Uh, equal pay for equal work. Very important for modern people. 1869 by the wonderful American feminist uh, Susan B. Anthony. Uh, the customer's always right. 1905, uh, well, uh, no glove, no love. There, you've got to know a lot. You've got to know that a glove is a condom in this proverb. It's an important proverb to know. And of course, life, <laughs> life is a box of chocolates. There we know the origin is from that famous uh, movie, Forrest Gump, from 1994. Taken as a whole, these few proverbs I just picked, these proverbs occupy themselves with business, sports, time, life, success, independence, freedom, and a few other general themes. Now we have to ask, do these proverbs then represent the American worldview? Proverbs have been studied to draw conclusions about certain national character traits and to establish the worldview or the shared mentality of certain folk groups. Alan Dundas, one of my teachers, uh, has dealt extensively in extrapolating the worldview from folkloristic uh, texts, including proverbs, but always with the caveat that these are generalizations. We must not forget that, at best, with some, with some kernel, perhaps, of truth, nevertheless. 
a much larger sample of proverbs would be need, needed, I think, to really come to worldview conclusions. But uh, another thing we have to keep in mind is when we do these type of attempts to see if we can perhaps see what proverbs amount to a modern Russian attitude, uh, we'll have to also study whether those proverbs are in fact still used, as I just showed you with uh, the morning hour is gold in its mouth. Mm. So proverb scholars have now advanced, of course, and I mentioned Grigory Blobich Permyakov earlier, we have that study or attempt <coughs> to look at so-called paremiological minima with modern statistical uh, means uh, to try to find out what are the truly um, modern uh, customary proverbs that most Russians or most Americans know. But there too, these attempts have flaws, as Valerie Mokienko uh, from Petersburg has pointed out. Uh, many, including Permyakov's uh, attempt, did not, he did not include modern proverbs. He, he took Dahl, you know, famous collection by Dahl, and, and, but that was already an antiquated collection, as you know. So to establish what are the Russian proverbs or American proverbs known right now, you would have to design a, a questionnaire that does question our students and say, look, what are the new proverbs that I don't even know? What do you say when you go skateboarding? What do you say when you do, I won't go into details, whatever you do that you do. You know, maybe there are new love proverbs, who knows? Anyhow, so, so though that, but still, we need at least that type of studies to draw some kind of uh, uh, Con conclusion, uh, and I think I want to warn a little bit of, of a national uh, uh, view matters. Anyhow, uh, so it, it is a complicated matter to decide uh, what proverbs are uh, really representing a, a certain American uh, view. And now I've kind of mentioned the word that what, what I want to get into in the second, next part of my talk is we, we really do have to pay more attention to the modern proverbs that have been neglected, in my opinion, uh, way too much. And two friends of mine in America, uh, Charles Clay Doyle from the University of Georgia and Fred Shapiro from Yale University and I, over a number of years have tried to put together a dictionary of modern proverbs. And the question already started in a way, what is a modern proverb? So to at least attempt, we could have chosen, for the younger students among you, we could have said maybe the year 2000. But uh, being old as we are, we probably wouldn't have found very many. So anyhow, we, took, we arbitrarily chose the date 1900. If we could not find an earlier text reference than 1900, we decided we would include it in this dictionary of modern proverbs. And after many years of work, using the, the uh, internet and so on, uh, we came up with about almost 1500. And it's an historic, I brought one copy, it's down there in my briefcase, Kevin, if you want to get it out, we could maybe send it around. Uh, I think, yeah, take a look. We could maybe send it around. It is an historical dictionary where we have attempted to find at least, as, yeah, that's the one, Kevin. As far as we can tell, is, is the earliest reference. Now, any good student who knows how to play Google, as we get more and more books on the internet, some of these dates will probably be proven wrong. But we have to start someplace, right? And there were surprises, by the way. I want to give you a couple. When you go to that dictionary, I insisted on us doing that. At the very end, there's a list of proverbs where you would have thought, wait a minute, what's wrong with these three professorial types? How come that modern proverb isn't in there? So we added a list of proverbs that we found were older than 1900. I'll give you a couple examples. You are what you eat, 1887. An elephant never forgets, 1886. Oh, he has a good one. Behind every great man, there's a great woman. My wife, my wife, for example. 1886. Money isn't everything. 1870. You can prove anything with statistics. I would have thought that would be relatively new, wouldn't you? 
1852. The best things in life are free, 1881, and so on. Okay? So what I'm really saying is, I think we need to include diachronic research in our proverb studies. And of course, so I don't forget to mention it, we need the context. I don't have time today to give you the context of these proverbs, right? Uh, but in the dictionary, we have the earliest references we found, we have included the context and a couple more and bibliographical information uh, and so on. Anyhow, it can be stated that most modern pro American proverbs are one of little bit linguistic things now, are straightforward indicative sentences with little formulaic or poetic characteristics. Like, for example, they don't make things like they used to. Hmm? A considerable number of proverbs follow the pattern you can't plus a verb, thereby continuing an established proverbial way of expressing the impossibility of a situation or action. For example, you can't put toothpaste back into the tube. <laughs> kind of like that. But, uh, or you have the very established proverbial pattern, don't or do not, plus the verb, or never, uh, uh, as imperatives, right? And of course we have those in modern proverbs as well. Don't get caught with your pants down. Or never give anything away that you can sell, from 1953. But such, interestingly, such proverbial imperatives are rather rare, indicating perhaps that people today, maybe I'm right about this, that people today are less willing to be told directly what to do or what not to do. In other words, the obvious didactic nature of many traditional proverbs appears to be on the decline. Notice I'm choosing my words carefully, I say appears. I only have 1,400 texts to base this on. And the challenge still is to find more modern proverbs. So it's hard. Try, try to find modern proverbs in, in, in Russian. It is not easy because you don't know the folk group that uses them. Right? The most prevalent structures, and I think you would almost have expected this, the most prevalent structures of these new American proverbs actually follow patterns that we all know in many languages. For example, if you, can, if you can X, you can Y. If you can dream it, you can do it. Quite a few proverbs on that pattern. Better X than Y. Better a big fish in a little pond than a little fish in a big pond. No X, no Y. Very popular structure. Four words, four syllables, often in English. Right? No guts, no glory. Many, many proverbs. Uh, and a couple other structures. There is no such thing as X. The most popular one, there is no such thing as a free lunch. You hear that almost daily in America. From not that new, 1917. Uh, there, are no, oh, there are no X, only Y. There are no bad dogs, only bad owners. And very popular modern proverb on the structure, one man's X is another man's Y. One man's trash is another man's treasure. Okay. So you can see there are very, very basic structures we all know about. As English language proverbs in general, modern American proverbs also have an average length of about seven words. Nothing changed there, really. As one would expect, a minimum of two words, a topic and a comment, are required for a full proverb. While they are relatively rare, they range from manners matter, which is kind of an interesting proverb, behavior matters in other words, manners matter, 1909, to the slang proverb, life sucks, life is problematic, and to the scatological images as shit happens. Shit happens is relatively new, well, not, not, 1944 is the earliest reference we found. I might almost have thought that might be more modern. You know, shit was not exactly a word one used in popular company. Kevin and I never use that word. <laughs> okay, proverbs consisting of four monosyllabic words are quite popular as short pieces of rather directly, I'm going to stress that, directly expressed insights that often lack any metaphorical element. Go with the flow. However, many of them follow a parallel structure with or without rhyme. 
Make Love, Not War, I'm sure you know that, 1965. And very, very important nowadays, Last Hired, First Fired. Right? Regarding rhyme, it should, however, be noted that this proverbial marker, very popular marker for remembering proverbs, right? that this proverbial marker does not play a major role in modern proverbs. Among them, I'll give you at least two that do have the rhyme, move your feet, lose your seat. I felt that way today when I was standing in the line to see Lenin. You know, and I thought, well, if I move my feet, I'm going to lose my space in the line. So I didn't move my feet, and I stood there for an hour and a half. Anyhow, in different ways for different days. So there you have a, a rhyme pattern. Of course, there are also proverbs of much greater length, reaching up to more than 20 words. As for example, it is not the size of the dog and the fight that matters, it's the size of the fight in the dog. I have to read this because my brain is not good enough to say the whole thing. <laughs> and you, you know, for the students, you can see that proverbs that get to be that long, uh, if anything, they will exist in variance and you will not enjoy them. Nobody wants to listen to a long proverb. It has to come out a little bit quicker than that. As has been the case for centuries, the originators of modern proverbs are also generally not known. However, it had, it's a little bit easier nowadays to discover this. As has also always been the case with earlier proverbs, some modern proverbs have simply been attributed to certain well-known persons. Research has shown that such attributions can usually not be proven, even though people will cling to these claims when citing such proverbs. This is something that has always taken place. But here's a nice one. For example, a woman without a, a, woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a wonderful, I'll, I'll read it, it's a wonderful feminist proverb, right? A woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. 1976 has been attributed to uh, when I was young, Kevin and I were young, I used to think she was very beautiful, feminist Gloria Steinem. Uh, attributed to her even though she has denied it publicly. And I think she would have liked to have taken the credit. By now we have discovered that it is probably not an American proverb after all, since the Australian political journalist Irina Dunn claims to have coined it in 1970. Uh, but there are modern proverbs for which it is known precisely who originated them, when and where. Such original citations by known persons begin, of course, as statements uh, in books, articles, speeches, motion pictures, songs, as they are repeated, they become quotations, and with ever more frequent use, di with different functions in different contexts, right? Often without awareness of the originator, these memorable texts can become proverbs. A perfect example is, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country that began with President John F. Kennedy, as some of you know, inaugural address of January 20th, 1960. Another popular proverb comes from Erich Segal's novel Love Story, one of the cult movies that we young students watched in 1970. Love means never having to say you're sorry. I use that a lot at home. Uh, it has also long been established that advertising slogans have given rise to new proverbs, you know that. As for example, when you're number two, you try harder. And uh, It started in 1962. We know the advertising agent who started that for the advertising campaign for Avis Car Rental. Music, of course, does the same thing. I already mentioned it takes two to tangle. Uh, that proverb that has been translated, long translated into many languages, started in 1952 with Pearl Bailey's uh, famous um, song. Uh, there is also a proverb uh, very popular since 1968. If you've got it flaunted, uh, basically if you have something showed off, if you have a Porsche or a Mercedes, you ought to, you ought to show it to people. Now, let's take one look yet at what are the realia 
uh, as Pamela Koch would have talked about, the realia. What are the realia of these modern American proverbs? And I kind of thought it was a little bit surprising that animals, for example, still play a considerable role in them. Uh, cats, cows, dogs, horses, pigs, but also wild animals, elephants, uh, and uh, monkeys, and so on, uh, certainly are part of it. Here's one of my favorites. It's a, what we would call a proverbial interrogative. In other words, a proverbial question, right? See if you like this. A bird may love a fish. Do you know how it goes? A bird may love a fish, but where would they live? <laughs> kind of like, I like that. It comes, by the way, from a very famous uh, play by Joseph Stein, The Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, and it, that became a very popular musical in America in, in 1964. And then, uh, how about this one? Uh, you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find your handsome prince. Is that known in Russia? <laughs> uh, you know, it, uh, I'll tell you a secret. It, uh, the, the, first, the, the first fairy tale, the first fairy tale in the in the Brother Grimm fairy tale collection is the Frog Prince. And uh, but many of you are nodding your heads. Uh, that fairy tale is, is a kind of a liberating tale where the princess, uh, the frog, her golden ball had fallen into the well and the little slimy, little ugly frog says, I'll get that ball for you if you let me climb in bed with you. It's a beauty and the beast story, of course. Anyhow, she says, of course, I'll do anything for you. And, and the frog goes, gets the ball. Little princess goes to bed, this, this, with frog comes and let the princess let me sleep with you. And she says, No way in hell that will I let you sleep with me. Well, anyhow, in utter desperation, she finally takes that damn frog, touches that slippery thing, and throws it against the wall. So, there is no kiss scene in the German fairy tale. But people, the, it, the fairy tale belongs to the folklore uh, narrative cycle of Beauty and the Beast. And usually, <coughs> in the Beauty of the Beast tales, the beautiful maiden overcomes the ugly animal, learns to appreciate a nice man who just happens to be not good looking like I, and kisses him. Right? So, this proverb is thought to have originated from the fairy tale, but it hasn't. There are no, no variants that have, in English or in German, that have the, uh, that have the kiss scene. So it's kind of a, it, it shows you once again the fascination of looking at proverbs from a historical, cultural, literary uh, point of view. OK, a uh, couple more things. Uh, you would probably expect that certain realia would come up quite a bit in American proverbs, obviously from the um, pecuniary aspects of our lives, namely money and business, uh, put your money where your mouth is. Here's a good one. If you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. Mm -hmm. right? you, I think you can, you can, that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, but it's not all that new from 1926. Sports play a major role in the modern proverbs. It isn't whether you win or lose that counts, it's how you play the game. And here's one, since I hear the soccer uh, championship is coming to, to Russia, here's, here's one that would certainly fit. You can think of this. You can't score if you don't shoot. You can't score if you don't shoot from 1960, 65. Here's, the, here's the, perhaps the biggest surprise. Where's the technology? Where, where is technology in the modern American problems? Did we not do our work well enough? That's, of course, certainly a possibility. I'm not a rocket scientist. We do have the expression that isn't rocket science, but that is not a problem. Right? Uh, so we, we have things like garbage in, garbage out from the computer world, but there is no mentioning of any, of any technology. And here's a question I have for you in, in, in Russian. Do you uh, abbreviate some of your proverbs by just using the first letters? For example, garbage in, garbage out, you could say in English, ego. Ego, and people will know what you're saying. You don't. I'll give you one more, which I learned from my students. Uh, 
One day we had a, bag, a, a, news, a student newspaper and there was a kind of an illustration and in it was the word YOLO. YOLO. Y-O-L-O. -O, YOLO. You live only once. See, there's, there's always one student in the group. Very good. Very good. But I, I, I have, you know, I'm basically showing you just don't know them all, right? And, and, and so that's would be, that would be uh, uh, another one. Perhaps the newest proverb that, that I have to bring to you today is there is an app for everything, mm -hmm. right? So that doesn't, that doesn't surprise you. But you know, that comes with disappointment. The earliest reference I found this far, and there's a little bit of nationalism in Americans too, you know. The earliest reference I found is in the British newspaper The Guardian on mm -hmm. August 10th, 2009. But proverbial news travels fast and wide. And the first American reference found thus far is the St. Louis Post-Dispatch from October 17, 2009. That's only three months. And now, when I get back to the States, I will play with my computer and I'm going to try to prove that I can beat August 10, 2009, the British earliest example. I'm having fun. Anyhow, uh, almost done. Life, just life plays a major role in these 1400 proverbs that I'm talking about. Uh, for example, uh, some of them are quite negative about life. Life is a bitch, life sucks, mm -hmm. when things don't go well. I used for my title more positively, life is a journey. Or this one I think has been translated into Russian if I'm not mistaken. If life hands you lemons, make lemonade. Very popular proverb. In, uh, but notice, it isn't particularly old. Uh, young, it's from 1910, mm -hmm. so it just about got into our dictionary. Really, this is this is the one that I like. Life begins at 40. Uh, actually, I'm, there are variants of proverbs. I say life begins at 70, right? Uh, anyhow, so uh, a couple more examples, perhaps. Many times when you look at proverb definitions, the word metaphor or image comes up a lot. But if you look at, if you read those 1400 texts, you're going to find that many of them actually are not particularly metaphorical at all. They're pretty straightforward. Look at this. You cannot use your friends and have them too. In other words, take advantage of your friends and, and keep them, right? Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> I have to laugh at this one. 1960, old age is better than the alternative. <laughs> if I were dead, I wouldn't be sitting here. Wouldn't you be lucky? And I'm almost done. Uh, love is where you find it. Beauty does not buy happiness. Success is never final. That's nice. Success is never final. Right? Now, I don't want to delve too deeply into this. There are, of course, something that hasn't been done by many paramiologists or paramiographers is collect dirty and obscene proverbs. They actually are quite popular. I want to stress, dirty proverbs have always been popular. People are people. We don't change. <coughs> but uh, they were not recorded because they couldn't be published. People wouldn't publish them. There were some secret publications in Paris, uh, Dimitri, that, where you can find uh, dirty collections. And that was you know, so. I I know those collections, but they didn't they didn't make it into the mainstream collections. You know, but we have you know, give you a couple of examples. Not very nice. If you still shit, it will still it will stink. Don't shit where you eat. You know, and those are kind of metaphorical in, in, in many ways. Right? Uh, there are, of course, proverbs about sex. Keep your dress down and your panties up. No glove, no love, I mentioned. But then also a serious one. No means no. You know, if, if you don't want to have a sexual encounter uh, with someone. Right? Uh, everybody lies about sex. Uh, there's no such thing as bad sex. And, of course, sex sells. And there you have one more two word proverbs. But I would argue that uh, man does not live by sex alone, right? to cite a so-called anti-proverb based on the biblical claim that man does not live by bread alone. The humorous, ironic, or satirical alteration of proverbs has a long tradition, as we know, indicating that the folk is perfectly capable of liberating itself 
from the at times too didactic or moralistic proverbs. Such anti-proverbs as absence makes your heart wander, <laughs> absence makes your heart fonder, and wander meaning starting to look for other partners, right? I wonder if you like this one. Beauty is, you know the proverb, beauty is only skin deep. Mm -hmm. But how about beauty is only skin? <laughs> Good, isn't it? You know, and then, uh, this is maybe the, the summum bonum of anti-proverbs. A very simple proverb, nobody is perfect, right? But all that I need to do is break the word nobody and say, nobody is perfect. <laughs> just, just that one little split, <laughs> and you really have a, a quite a, 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 a very telling uh, uh, proverb that has caught on, right? That's the key issue here. It's not a one-day wonder, but rather people actually say it or write it. This kind of manipulation of proverbs is also very popular. I don't need to go into this anymore in headlines, in movie titles, uh, and so on. <coughs> Anyhow, one thing is for certain to, to finish up. One thing is for certain. English language proverbs and also specifically American proverbs are well and alive in the modern age that surely, and this I want to stress, surely creates its new problems. We have to overcome the idea that problems are old. They're not. Some of them are. Some of them have dropped out. Some of them have remained and most likely always will. But uh, time will always fly, I think. You know, time flies, tempus fugit. Our forebearers were smart, you know. But there are new ones, and we lose others. There's no doubt about it. As folk wisdom, they express the attitudes, beliefs, mores, and values of the people uh, who use them. You know, uh, not everybody has the same opinions, but you would not use a proverb if it, if it doesn't fit. Right? If, uh, so uh, we know from, 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 our, from our friend uh, Arvo Kriegman, we know we, we have to look at the polyfunctionality. And, and police situativity and police semanticity of proverbs. Right? Proverbs only become alive when we look at them in a context. Right? So they, they, they do not only play an important communicative role in the United States, but with English being the lingua franca of the world, they are a global phenomenon evermore. As verbal momenta monumenta humana, a term that I'm borrowing from Matti Kuzi, one of the most famous proverb scholars from Finland, as verbal monumenta humana, they warrant the attention of cultural historians, folklorists, linguists, philologists, and other scholars in the social sciences and the humanities. Proverbs are indeed very much in season in America, and I know in Russia as well, of course. And the proverbial statement that a proverb is worth a thousand words will doubtlessly remain true for generations to come. Bolshoye spasiba. Questions from the audience, and uh, if you don't mind from my own self. So, the first question. You have mentioned the word anti-proverb. After all, you are the author of this term. And so I was just wondering if there are any pairings of a modern proverb and an anti-proverb. You have mentioned uh, nobody's perfect versus nobody's perfect. What about other modifications? And are they always creative or are they context-based? Well, I, I like that question. I, I think that's what I meant with the word when I said at the very end uh, that nobody is perfect is not a one-day wonder. In other words, uh, for something to be an, uh, uh, an establishment, to be for an anti, for a creation or a, a playful variation of a proverb. To become a real proverb, it has to be able to be used in different contexts. With in, 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 in otherwise, it is just a play on words. You know. 
so a journalist can, of course, for a particular headline, make a pun by playing with the proverb. And I can call that an anti-proverb, but for it to become a new proverb, it has to be uh, adaptable, it has to fit into multiple situations, not just that one particular headline. Right? And that's why I quickly, at the end, use those three poly words, polyfunctionality, polysituativity, and polysemanticity. Uh, so there is that whole spectrum. If you look at earlier proverb scholarship, many, many of the definitions will use the word a proverb is didactic. But they're not always didactic. And even if it looks like it is didactic, that doesn't mean that I cannot use it in a satirical way or in an ironic way. Do you see what I'm saying? It all, it, it, it really, um, we can look at structuralism, as I did a little bit just to show you what, what maybe some of the patterns are, but to even understand the proverb, no body is perfect, you really, it would be nice to have the context, wouldn't it? Oh, may, may I have an additional question to, to this statement? Um, do we need uh, a kind of frequency criterion? How do we decide what is a real proverb and what is just a funny expression or an aphoristic expression used by some people? But I, I knew Dimitri would ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, Dimitri, I get that all the time. You know, my, my students, uh, when I challenge them to, to, to bring, to, to collect new proverbs, you know, I really don't, to be, to be frank, I don't know the answer. How much is frequent? That's really what you're asking. How much is frequent? Well, uh, when I was young, some 50 years ago, I would have said, well, if I find it in, let's just say, Tolstoy's novel and find it in Dostoevsky's, I find it in Solzhenitsyn, or let's just, if you just want to take, take, say, the 19th century, if I find it in 10 Russian authors in the 19th century, different contexts, I would have said, and it isn't in Dahl, let's just say, I would have said, I think I'm going to start, I'm going to start sticking out my paramulogical neck and say, I, little Wolfgang Wiener, <laughs> declares this is the problem. Because if I don't, we will never make any progress. <laughs> but to get to, the, to your question, it, it is now, I think, a little bit easier because we do have the internet. So, but you can still say, okay, Wolfgang, is it 5,000? Is it 10,000 hits? Is it 50,000 hits? Uh, I always tell my students, look, don't, don't bring me 500 hits, it's not good enough, it needs to be more than that, you know. And, Dimitri, you also, of course, even with modern proverbs, you would like a little bit of a time span, don't you? It, it, the trouble with Google searches is, of course, there's, uh, there's so much repetition. You know, sometimes if you have a, a proverb used in, a, in, in some kind of a media yeah. event or so, well, let's just take the, the, the football thing that's going to happen here. If there's going to be that one headline and it's going to be picked up by every paper and every newscast and, and all of a sudden you're getting 10,000 hits. <laughs> so, so I think using the internet, we have to use it, we have to use it with a little bit of care and, and, and head. But uh, I think all the best we can do is, as linguists and, and proverb scholars and phraseologists is to uh, try to find, um, I, I like the idea of looking for the, uh, I learned that from my friend Alan Dundas, the, the famous American folklorist. If in fact you, you think you have a new proverb and you even find variants, I think then you can pretty much decide you have a proverb. You've know? you got to have the original to play with it. So, but I, I appreciate the question. It, it, I'm not making light of it. Uh, uh, and uh, when we did our dictionary, maybe I can conclude the answer this way, Dimitri. When we, when we made the dictionary, it was my attitude to, what's the word I'm looking for? 
to err, to err, to make a mistake, to err on the on the on the inclusive side, mm -hmm. because otherwise we would have missed maybe two or three proverbs that the youngsters actually know quite well, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. But I, I cannot stress enough. As far as dictionary making, lexicography, uh, trying to do this dictionary modern proverbs, that has that was the biggest challenge I think I've ever. Had. When I did the big one with, with 20,000 uh, so-called, as you have now learned, American proverbs, yeah, that was work. Yes, it was work. But this, the, the modern thing, is, is innovation. And I don't know. Yeah. Do this for fun with your... Maybe, maybe you remember, Katrin Steyer brought a wonderful yeah. proverb. Uh, knapp vorbei ist auch daneben. Yeah. I like it very I, much, I do. but I've never heard it yeah. outside of linguistic discussions. That's right. There you go. So linguists are also not always right. Alexey Dmitrievich, Alexey. Just uh, to add something to Dmitrievich's question and to criteria, <coughs> which uh, can uh, help to draw uh, some distinction between uh, famous quotations, with words. Uh, popular slogans and proverbs. If people consistently call something a proverb, uh, for example, as the, pro the proverb says, so it is a proverb. The proverb says, but you and I know immediately it really isn't a proverb, so it's not foolproof. Then you have this other problem in English. We have the word proverb and saying. Saying at times can mean proverb, but to some, to us here assembled, saying and proverb are not identical. So it's it's. But Marcus helped. Uh, there is no doubt about it. No doubt. No doubt. You sure, Cos? Any other questions? Yeah, I, I have one question. I remember from times of Perestroika, <laughs> uh, one uh, American saying. Uh, it was new for us uh, in that time. Uh, if you are so smart, uh, why uh, aren't you so rich? <laughs> is, is this same real proverb or American proverb? Well, I, I know it's not in our dictionary. It, 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 is, it is probably well. Remember, I mentioned I mentioned that one about uh, the, the fish and the and, and the bird. It, 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 you, you could classify it as a proverbial interrogative, a, a genre that does exist. Mm -hmm. it's, you know those proverbial uh, interrogatives are kind of fun. Uh, is the Pope Catholic? Does the bear shit in the woods? So uh, does the chicken have lips? So, so people, there have been, my friend Charles Doyle in America has made wonderful collections of those. Are you sure of any other questions? You can ask in yeah. Russian as well. Yeah. Uh, Volgan, I have been collecting Somali proverbs for more than 50 years. And now I have only 10,000 proverbs uh, at my disposal. My question is, how many proverbs are expected to exist in every language or every culture, approximately? Oh, well, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's, a million, that's a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, well, you know, I have already, I have already admitted to you that, that there appears to be that strange phenomenon that the Native Americans or Indians hardly have any proverbs at all. But then you can go to, right across uh, from Peterburg, you can, go, you can go to Helsinki, and you can find in the Finnish Literary Museum, you can find two million proverb slips. Uh, the biggest German collection that uh, Karl Friedrich Wallander did between 1867 and 1880 has 250,000. Uh, so uh, it's hard to say. George. Uh, uh, but I mean, it goes, it certainly goes. I mean, you know, all those proverb collections I have, you take Mokien take, take Valerie Mokienko's uh, uh, newest, uh, that wonderful red volume, the three volumes that he did. 
uh, what did he say to us? Uh, uh, did he say something like 18 or 20,000, Kevin? Yeah. yeah, and my Dictionary of American Proverbs has, has about close to 20,000. But that, I know that is by no means all. You know. um, but uh, there are, and if you look at the Africa, you know, there's so much more work that needs to be done. We have uh, fantastic African proverb collections great scholarly collections, the Vamba Proverbs, for example, that Matikuzi did, or Shaven, who did Swahili Proverbs, you did the Somali. Uh, what I would like to see is do the same thing that we have done for European Proverbs. In other words, that were linguistic cultural connections between or among African languages. So I, for example, I would like to see a Nigerian proverb collection that takes all the many languages alone that are spoken in Nigeria and attempts to see what overlaps are there. How much borrowing is there from one tribal language to the rest? There are intermarriages and so on, but we don't even have that. But we have a tremendous amount of African proverb collections, but no real comparative work. And with the modern this is for the next generation, for, for with the modern computer databases. It, it shouldn't be so difficult to do a little bit more of that work. And one could start maybe just doing Nigeria, because we know of, there are so many. There's a, there's a wonderful project in Africa by a, a, a Catholic uh, uh, priest, uh, my friend Joe Haley. We, we had a big African proverb conference, and was at Georgia maybe 20 years ago, and created an African proverb society. And uh, every year, we publish about maybe a dozen uh, languages that you and I have never heard of, tribal languages of just a 100 proverbs, but explained what they mean and so on in the original language. But what we need to do is put it all together. And the computer will make that possible. Another question from Nadia Konstantin Nariatseva. Well, first uh, I want to, to say that I like very much the, uh, your extract about uh, enumerating the first American province and referring to the year of the appearance and to the themes of the year, uh, devoted sport, success, uh, freedom, business, etc. They are all very American. Uh, and my question is, um, are, are there any proverbs marked as American English in uh, um, dictionaries of proverbs, proverbs published in Great Britain? You, you, so your question is whether there are British proverb collections that now say that this is an American proverb. Is that, is that your question? Well, uh, in, many, in many British uh, dictionaries, uh, many words are marked as American uh, English. Right. Are proverbs marked as well American English, or they are not? Some of them are. There, there is, you know, my friend John Simpson, who you might be interested. John Simpson has now retired, but he is the one who pushed through the second edition of the famous thing, Oxford English Dictionary. He has just retired. But in 1982, John Simpson published uh, the, the concise, o o o the concise, how's it go? The, co the concise Oxford English proper dictionary. And, uh, and in the, in the meantime, uh, Jennifer Speak uh, has taken over the editorship. It's now in the fifth edition. Now, I like your question in a way. Our dictionary came out in 2012, right? <laughs> she, of course, now is borrowing from us and saying, this is an American problem. But you know, you can't be angry as a scholar. Why do you work? I mean, you, you do this thing to, to make things uh, available. Uh, but even before that, there have, for example, if and she includes the, the proverb that I quoted from J.F. Kennedy, you know, ask not what your country can do for you. So, so, so she knew that and she said uh, of American origin. But, but my two co-authors of this fiction, modern dictionary, we've had fun. Oh, I see, I see Jennifer has taken that over from us, you know. <laughs> so. 
once again, thank you for your incredible report. It was really illuminating and I should say that we're going to have a discussion after the second report. So right now, I think I should yield the floor to the next speaker.